Okay, so um, uh, so uh, I think last time uh, I gave this. Uh, so let me just briefly recap uh, what I uh, said last time. So one of the very important messages I wanted to convey was this connection between Feynman diagrams to uh, permutations in symmetric group to a covering map and uh, which got associated to discrete points on a world sheet uh, on the modelized space. Sorry, I keep saying uh, on the modelized space of the world sheet. So discrete points or individual world sheets. So individual Feynman diagrams Uh, uh, so discrete, so individual world sheet. So, so this uh, uh, um, I I, uh, I illustrated it uh, in a somewhat abstract way in terms of the permutation uh, associating the computation of Gaussian correlators through weak contractions with a problem of permutations, which I then said is associated with a covering map, and which I, uh, which in turn I uh, said is related to a point on the modelized space. But in terms of these permutations, it might have been a little abstract. So, uh, so I decided to to have a couple of examples uh, just to show you how very explicitly you can see this. And I just, um, uh, you need not, no, I mean, uh, maybe it'll be there in the recording and you can go back and uh, look at all the details, but I'll just, let me explain what I have over here. So consider, in, so let's look at the case of the Gaussian matrix model. Consider a correlator like trace m cubed to the four, four point function, right? Uh, you know what to do. You just do with contractions. Let's look at the planar level. So this is genus zero. Connected. So this is one Feynman diagram I've drawn that corresponds to that planar, uh, uh, which contributes to this. I'll draw another one and to show you the difference. But this is one. So, uh, so what have I done here? I should have didn't have time to label things, but I'll. Uh, So, uh, so this is a Feynman diagram. I've drawn, uh, forget right now about all the additional structure, but just concentrate on the red lines. They are double line diagrams. These are the four points corresponding to so the blue vertices. These are the vertices. They are associated with the four different insertions. Uh, and uh, the red lines are the weight contractions. OK, so let's translate this into the language of permutations that I was telling you. Firstly, notice, so I will divide each edge into a half edge. If you wish, you can think of the original thing as trace m cubed. You can think of each trace m cubed has three legs coming out of it, right? So that's what I've drawn over here. There are four, four of these, and each of these has three legs coming out of it, and then you would contract in multiple ways. That's what you do. Uh, you can wake contract this with this, this with this, uh, and I've done one particular assignment here which I'll explain. But this is what you would do, and so this is the starting block, and then you kind of do various wake contractions. So, so that's why I've labeled these as half edges. So, uh, so firstly, notice that because it's trace m cubed, and there are three, and this is a four, and to the power four, there are twelve of these half edges. And that 
in our earlier language, this is the k that I was talking about, and the sum over all the ki. So this is the degree of the, which will eventually become the degree of the map. Okay. Um, so uh, before I, um, uh, so first thing I said there are three permutations: one associated with the vertices, one with the edges, and one with the faces. So let's go through each of these. The one with the vertices is the simplest because that's fixed for you. And in fact, that's what I've drawn over here. That's just the cyclic order at each vertex. And so I'm calling it A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B1, B2, B3. I'm taking a certain counterclockwise ordering, D1, D2, D3, C1, C2, C3. So there's a, so there are, so if you wish, the permutations will act on these half edges. So these are the set of 12 objects on which I will be taking permutations. So these 12 objects are these A1, A2, A3, and there's one permutation which is associated with the vertices, and that's just the cyclic ordering, A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3, C1, C2, C3, D1, D2, D3. So that's why I called it as three cycles, of, uh, I mean four cycles, each of length three. That's this. So that's my beta, what I call beta is. So that's universal. That will be true for all the Feynman diagrams. That's what you're fixing. What changes with each Feynman diagram, as I said, is the big contractions. Which edges are you associating with, uh, with uh, each other? So in this particular case, this big contraction corresponds to, as I said, uh, those are made of transpositions, so uh, of cycles of length two, and there'll be six of them and because you're contracting them pairwise. And how are you contracting them? Here I'm contracting A1 with B1, A2 with D2, A3 with C1, C3 with B2, and so on. So that's what I've written over here. A1 with B1 is this, A3 with C1 is this, etc. Okay, so that's a big contraction. So that's a permutation of length uh, all just two of these things and um, uh, length two, um, uh, six of them. Uh, so that's also part of the symmetric group of, these are all belonging to the symmetric group of 12 elements. Now the faces. Now the faces is uh, interesting. Uh, to re uh, let me just tell you an algorithm and I can um, I can explain it more later, uh, the precise, um, uh, this thing may be in the tutorial, but I'll associate with, let's say, this face. I'll, I'll start from this vertex, and I look at A1. I start from this vertex, look at A3. This vertex, look at D, D2. So A1, B3, D2 is the permutation associated with this face. Uh, then similarly with this face, it's B2, C2, D3. There's a certain orientation as you can see. I'm going around in the same anti-clockwise way, and this is B2, this is C2, and then this is D3. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, so, so this, you see, you get, basically, you have, a, you get, so for each of these, you see each of these faces have three edges. I mean, this is a triangle, this is a triangle, the triangle, the outer one is also a triangle. So you get three to the four. So three, uh, four cycles of length three each it is the particular uh, thing that you associate with these faces. And it's a good exercise, a simple exercise for you to check that gamma is beta inverse, alpha inverse. Alpha being a transposition is the same as alpha inverse, so I'm just written it as alpha. So it's very easy for you to check. Uh, so for instance, uh, if you look at what happens to A1, under alpha, A1 goes to B1, and then beta inverse is the opposite ordering. So it's like B3, B2, B1. It's the anti-cyclic ordering. So, uh, so if A1 goes to B1, uh, then B1 will go to B3, so it becomes B3, B2, B1, so B, B1 will go to B3. So that's what you see over here, A1, B3. And then if you 
follow it through again. What does B3 go to? B3 goes to D3 over here on the alpha, and D3 goes to D1. So, uh, uh, um, sorry, D3 goes to D2 when you go in the opposite order. Uh, so that's the cycle, A1, B3, D2. So you can check all the rest. It's so alpha, beta, gamma is one. Is one. That's uh, that that is zero. Sorry? That's a concept. Uh, Gene, the fact that the target space, so I'll come now to the covering space interpretation. This is purely the permutation okay. interpretation. But that relationship, because it's a planar graph, right? No, uh, no, it's because the target space is planar. Uh, it's because it will be true for all graphs. Uh, including non-planar graphs? Yeah, including non-planar graphs. Because it's a statement about the monodromy in the target space. Uh, when you lift, okay, maybe I'll show you the covering space picture and then it'll become a little more clear. Uh, so, um, oh, so, sorry, can I? Yes. Follow up on thing. So, if I drew this graph as a non planar one. Well, this is planar. Yeah, this but if you drew it, then the cyclic structure would change over here. Yeah. And then that would change everything. I mean, so you would have to look at it and you would have to work out the alpha, beta, gamma there. Still be one. Alpha, beta, gamma will always be one. That is even, it. Or non planar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that has to do with the target space. It has nothing to do with. The moment you're not doing target space, you're just describing. Yeah, I'm just describing this with contraction. And it, it's, it's a remarkable fact, I think. I, and from the language of permutations, this is, in a sense, has to follow because. The um, the uh, the alpha yeah I don't know how it's a simple way to say it but uh, it's essentially gamma is not an uh, is not an independent thing and it's really fixed by the beta and alpha in this particular way this is sort of how you would generate gamma if you wish uh, so um, yeah so it, it's just big contractions. Uh, put in the language of permutations. So, and, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so, if you're looking at non, uh, non planar target space, what would be the angle of the final diagram? Uh, so, so here I'm just, uh, my philosophy is you start with a theory. In this case, I'm starting with the Gaussian or the one Hermitian matrix model. Uh, and. And in this case, the target space happens to be genus zero. It was not put in, it comes out. Uh, um, there might be other theories where the target space is uh, the same. There would be some curse. You'd see over here, for instance, the, um, this is, this is this, I, I'll later talk about the similar story for the symmetric orbifold. There it will be slightly different, this how the story goes. Uh, mm, uh, but. At this stage, the target space is always. So for this structure, the target space, then you can add various bells and whistles and things might change in terms of the target space. But for the, this is the simplest kind of big contraction. For that, it is zero. Okay, Just yeah. What if it's not the rather with dependence on space time? This, this permutation structure is also there, no? This permutation structure is there for the, uh, how you contract it, exactly, it is there. Uh, and so this is why I think this is a universal piece of it. So there will be always a piece which will be the sphere, mm -hmm. and then there might be other things, and there might be more decorations. But, uh, but just to illustrate, this is another big contraction of the same trace M cube. Another planar diagram. Well, I couldn't draw non-planar diagrams, but can I actually? Uh, but this is another big contraction. The beta, as I said, is the same as this. Okay. What is different here is the wick contraction. So alpha, this is associated to the edges. So this is the wick contraction. So it, it's different here because, okay. So I think I had A1, A2, A3. So I'm preserving the same cyclic order at each. Ah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I'll explain that. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Let me. Uh, I'll just very quickly show this because this uh, just showed the permutation uh, structure. Uh, so then we'll be done with the permutations discussion. So uh, uh, so here it's a different big contraction. You see, a one is contracted to a b one, but now a two is contracted with b three. Unlike over here, where a two is contracted with d two, here a three is contracted with d two. So that's reflected here in this cycle structure. Uh, and beta um, is the same as before. And if you s do the same thing and associate, now you see the faces are here. You had four faces, one, two, three, and the external face. And they were all triangular. But here you have four faces again, but two are of s with sides two, and two, namely this one and the outer one, are uh, quadrilaterals. So that's why the cycle structure of gamma is now 2 square, 4 square. This is also degree 12. They're all permutations of degree 12, uh, except that the cycle structure is different. A and if you look over here, what is the cycle structure of this one? It's A1, B3. If you look over here, for uh, so this one, you can see it is uh, A2, B2, C2, D2. That's this. Uh, and then there's B3, C1, and then the outer one is this. And again, it's a useful exercise to check that this is true. It just follows. But OK, so that's the permutations, uh, alpha, beta, gamma, to give, give a concrete. Now let's look at the covering map picture. I drew a covering map picture, which might have been too abstract. So this is a two-dimensional picture uh, of the Riemann surface above and the Riemann surface below. And this is the covering map. So OK, so uh, uh, you should think of, uh, so as I said, in this particular case, there are three branch points in the target space. And you can take them to be 0, 1, infinity. So I've drawn them in these three ways. So, uh, so there's one, the star, these which are associated with the vertices, this which is associated with the centers of the edges, and this which is associated with the faces. So you can see that, uh, uh, so, so the pre images, you're supposed to think of all these four as pre images of this. Uh, so these are. This is a branch point, and uh, so it has. This is the branch point that you associate with the vertex, uh, with the vertices, or therefore the cycle beta, and so it's a branch point of order three, uh, and there are four of them, and that's what you have over here. So there are four branch points. So there are four pre-images, and each one is a branching of order three. How do you see that order three? You see here there was only one line coming out of this. And here there are three. So you should think of think of this plane. And this is why, OK, it's sometimes helpful to draw, complete this triangle. Um, so I'm just drawing it the three edges by different things. So you have a triangle like this. So yeah. uh, so you have the pre-image of this triangle from the x space is this. So this is one pre-image of that triangle. So if you wish the interior of this triangle, so if I were to shade it, this would be one shading. But then there are three pre-images, because you can have one. Now the other one, which is, have to uh, think it's so this is another triangle, which is a pre-image of this triangle. And then there's a third triangle, which is more difficult to draw. Uh, but you can see that there would be something which would 
which would sort of go from the same vertex. There's a dotted line there. And there would be a wavy line which would go from there to this one. So I don't know if this picture is clear, but you should think of this as, imagine looking at the lift of this. So this plane is, there's the triangle and then there's the exterior of the triangle, which is not shaded. Both have their pre-images. The exterior of this triangle, so the, the, ex, um, the exterior of this triangle, which I should also draw, <coughs> is the unshaded ones. It's very uh, messy, but uh, uh, so uh, so you should think of this triangle has three images here. This one, so uh, so there's the triangle, the exterior of the triangle, the triangle, exterior of the triangle, the triangle, and the exterior of the triangle. As you go around 360 degrees around this vertex, that you get three copies of this. You do that for each vertex, and you see it's a threefold cover. I mean, it's a branch point of order three. This is cubic, exactly. That's what this is saying. Yeah, the, zero. <laughs> the zero branch point, that one will, in this particular case, that's also cubic yeah. uh, because this is, and, and you can see that here if I were to draw. Now, if I were to draw these other things, it would also be, you'd see that there are, so these two were associated with this, then these two are associated with the, the other. And the black point is a square root. The, the black point is a square root, because you can see that it's, there's uh, one way to see it is that this red line, there are only two red lines coming out of it. But in this case, is it possible to write down a global it's very difficult to write these belly maps explicitly. And for four-point functions, it's in general not possible. Really? It's, it's a very complicated problem, and mathematicians write papers on just writing one belly function. <laughs> uh, but uh, three-point functions, you can write three point, uh, but four-point function on words. You can yeah, you can locally define it, but right. to write the global thing, it's... Is there it, it exists, you can show that it's some solution, and you can't write it explicitly. I mean, you can characterize it that it's the solution of certain equations, and then you can probably numerically do it, but yeah. But there is such yeah. a thing which doesn't require patches. Uh, yeah, and so you can, you can write down, because from sphere to sphere, it's, it's a, I'll talk about it, it's essentially a rational function, and with some degree in the top, degree 12 and degree 12. So that's what makes it, you'll have a degree 12 polynomial and a degree 12 polynomial, and you have to impose various conditions and so on. Yeah. More trivial. More trivial, but, but yeah, two and three point functions you can write down. Hmm. But this is the first non-trivial thing, yeah. For each one, I mean, this is. You mean these vertices? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. There is one uh, plane, plane, so to speak, for every. Yeah. So you can see there are four pre-images of these. For these also, you have four, but there are six pre-images for this because this is a degree two branch point. This is two to the six. And for this one, you can. I can do do the same thing here. And here, if you do the same exercise, you'll see that uh, here the, the number of pre-images are still six for this, because that's still two to the six. But uh, for gamma, which is the one associated with faces, this one is a branch point. These two are branch points of order two, and these two are branch points of order four. So that's why I wanted to draw this, because 
that's one case where the gamma structure is not the same for all the faces. And you can play around with this. This is just fun. You can <laughs> just draw pictures all day. And so, uh, and let's. Uh, 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 so, uh, so this is to illustrate that uh, this this part of the thing that so at least till here I kind of showed you kind of explicitly how you can kind of go, uh, and then this is the statement I mentioned in the case of this belly map as a mathematical theorem, and uh, uh, that. These, car these are, but, but maybe I'll work out something later in this uh, lecture, and you'll see why it's rigid, why it's a rigid problem, and you can only have discrete points. In the case of the Gaussian, I mentioned that the rigid points were these arithmetic Riemann surfaces. Uh, in this case, it will be slightly different uh, in the symmetric orbifold case, um, but uh, but the same principle applies. So. That's why I, this is sort of the broad philosophy, which I think in at least uh, two cases you see very explicitly realized. OK, so if so, the, uh, if uh, there are no questions. Yeah, so I mean, Yeah, that's also, OK, I can give various characterizations of it uh, in terms of um, uh, there is this object called the Strebel differential, which I will come to perhaps if I have time at the end. Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you can characterize it in terms of the number of big contractions. So, uh, so between, yeah, uh, so the fact that this one, there are three big contractions here. Uh, or between pairs of edges. The number of big contractions between pairs of edges is a way to characterize the points on the modelized space. So you can have the, the total number of big contractions is the same, but what changes between this and this is the, between here there are two big contractions between these two, here there's only one big contraction. Uh, and in this one there's zero big contractions between here and here. Whereas here there was one. So that, that discrete numbers capture the discrete points on the modelized space. <coughs> yeah. So it's basically the number of big contractions, uh, which is a measure of those points. OK, so uh, if this is OK, I want to go to the symmetric orbifold, which I had started discussing last time. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, this is a good way to get into that, because last time what I had discussed was uh, last time what I had discussed was that uh, uh, we start from this <coughs> So there we were looking at these trace correlators. Now we are looking at something a little more involved. It has space-time dependence because I'm looking at the, so this is the analog of trace m to the ki. These, as I mentioned last time, correspond to the ground states in the k kth twisted sector of the symmetric orbifold, a k-cycle twist. Uh, all the states are labeled by their conjugacy classes under the symmetric product, I mean the symmetric group. Uh, and uh, um, the single particle ones are labeled by cycles of length ki. Uh, and you can look at the ground state. Uh, and there was this Lunin Mathur had long ago. Uh, uh, so in that case, to compute this, 
because this symmetric orbifold is not not given in terms of a Lagrangian so easily. It's an orbifold CFT. So uh, to compute correlators like this, there wasn't a direct Feynman diagram prescription. Uh, but what Lunin and Mathur realized is that there is uh, there is a long ago and independent of any of this gate string duality, they just as a mathematical trick for computing this was using this covering space picture, which I described last time. So, so the covering space picture in that case was that you have so uh, just to draw again the diagram we saw last time. Um, yes. S two is the space time. S two is the space time. Yes. T to T to the n is the T four to the n. So we are looking at T four to the n mod S n, uh, and uh, this is. Uh, the where the space on which the CFT is living. So in that sense, it is the target space for the string. Okay, it'll be it's the boundary of the ADS3. So what is G stands for? Oh, genus G. What? Uh, of you can you can uh, again like for the matrix model or Yang Mills theory, organize the contributions genus by genus in the large n limit. So there is an N, and that there is a genus expansion. And that genus expansion will have this covering map interpretation. So in fact, so I'm considering an endpoint function. And this will be the target space. In this case, it's an S2. But as there were questions, I, I'm considering the simplest case where I have Euclidean ADS3 whose boundary is S2. But I could in principle, and I, but I, yeah. And in some cases for the torus, you see a similar phenomenon. I can tell you separately. You could consider the boundary, thermal ADS3 whose boundary is a T2. And you would have a similar story in that case as well. Um, so I should draw one more uh, uh, thing here. So what was this lunin mathur picture? The lunin mathur picture was that if you want to compute a correlator of, at say, x1, x2, and so on on your original space, you lift this to a covering space in which these fields become single valued. Because these are twisted sector fields, it's the same replica trick uh, logic that you lift it to this higher space. So this is there's some z1, z2. Uh, and on this, the fields are single valued. And, uh, here, when you go around the twist field, you get a face. Uh, and uh, I mean, if you, go, if you go ki times, then you come back to itself. So you, instead of doing that, you lift it to a field on the covering space where going around just means going to a different sheet and then you come back. Uh, so this was the very nice trick of Lunin Mathur that you can instead try to compute it uh, in this way. Uh, <coughs> And now we are going to give a math uh, physical interpretation of this trick in the sense that, that this world sheet is really, the, uh, this covering space is really will be identified with the world sheet of genus G and uh, with n punctures. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, so I described last time how you, they showed that on the covering space, sigma g n, this was just, when it's the ground state, it's basically just the identity operator uh, uh, on the, uh, uh, if I considered excitations, I could consider 
uh, more complicated operators, but here it's just the identity. Otherwise, I can excite D4 modes and I can have those. So this in the covering space just becomes a partition function, essentially. Uh, um, but of course, you would be wanting to know where did all the XI dependence go? That went into, the, into this covering map. Is the covering map gamma of z, which will be the analog of the belly map. It will be different from the belly map, because here now, I have a covering map which is branched at endpoints, unlike the three points that I had earlier. Uh, um, there was no, no other structure in the matrix model other than the vertices, edges, and faces, so that's why there were three branch points. Here now you have these <coughs> position labels, and you get, you'll get as many of them as there are, so up to xn. There'll be some branch point uh, for the xn. Uh, so, um, so where did all, so as I was saying, uh, everything goes into this, and this is essentially e to the minus So what you have is, uh, it's a conformal field theory. So if you lift it by a holomorphic map, it, it's, also, you can, uh, it's also a conformal field theory. But now there's a conformal anomaly coming from the pullback of this, because the wild factor, as I said last time, dx dx bar is equal to mod del gamma square dz dz bar. So there's a wild factor, which is what this phi is, and this is the dual action. So this is basically D2, <coughs> D2Z on the covering space. With something proportional to the central charge of this original CFD. Uh, so uh, yeah. Mm. Uh, so, so this is essentially something like this. Uh, uh, so all the information of computing the correlator is replaced by computing the covering map. Once you, the covering map will of course, so as I said last time, the covering map must have the property that, so x, which is the covering map, must be near z goes to zi must be xi plus some something proportional uh, it has a branching of order ki okay so this is the lunin mutter prescription to compute these correlation functions and now uh, Uh, I want to show you the similarity with what I was showing you so far. Uh, and for that, uh, actually, I'll reverse the logic a little. In the, in the previous example, we were going from here to here to here. Now we are going here. First, I want to show you, and this is related to these permutations uh, associated to these cycles. So th this part is OK. But there's a Feynman diagram you can associate with this. and actually. This picture was, uh, again, long ago suggested by, Fein, uh, by Buckman, Rastelli, and Rosamath. Uh, um, so, um, which is very similar to what I am just uh, what I was showing you there. Uh, so you have things that say x1, x2, x3, x4, and uh, you lift it up by this covering map to something involving z1, z2, z3, z4. So. So, that, 
So now, you see again, okay, so what have I done here? So the, the prescription is you draw on your original space, this space, and this point here is x equal to infinity. <laughs> Mm. And uh, uh, so this is the sphere. I have the point x equal to infinity. So I draw a red curve which encloses x equal to infinity, and I draw a sort of a dashed curve outside. So it's like a bifundamental line. It's not a toft uh, double line. It's uh, I mean it is a double line, but it's a bifundamental like line. And the two different things is. Uh, I, I, th there's a uh, motivation why this is m the natural picture because the symmetric orbifold arises as the infrared of a uh, uq un times um times gauge theory so it's fr coming from a d1 d5 system uh, and a d1 so you have a gauge group with the d1 and then there's something with the d5 and there are strings between them so uh, in the infrared those are the degrees of freedom and that's why Sort of the bifundamental is a natural thing, but yeah. Who's covering up with you? So uh, I just uh, let me just answer that. No, it is not. Uh, meaning there will be, but there are only discreetly many. So what the mathematical problem you have to solve? So I should write over here. Uh, it's good. You uh, said this. There will be a sum over the covering maps, and you have for each of them. You have to sum over the different possibilities. The inverse, the inverse uh, so it's the inverse is never. I mean, there'll be multi pre-images, many pre-images. Yes. So for a given covering map, you can find uh, the pre-images, and that's what, in a way, we are doing here. Uh, so you, so the prescription is you take your S two, draw this uh, uh, double line graph and then lift it by this, uh, take any one of these covering maps. The covering maps are uh, ones which have to obey this, and that's a rigid problem, as I've been saying, and that's a rigid problem. There'll be finitely many of them. Take any one of them, uh, and that will give you one Feynman diagram, just like over there. There were also many covering maps. Uh, each Feynman diagram corresponded to a covering map, and therefore, vice versa, every, each covering map corresponds to a Feynman diagram. Here, too, there'll be covering maps for each. Uh, for each covering map, there'll be a Feynman diagram, which will reflect the particular, um, uh, the, the way in which this covering is lifted. So I've drawn, for instance, one over here. Uh, and you can see that this pre-image so here you had two lines, but here now you have one, two, three, four lines. So this is of order two. It's a branch point of order two. Because here there were two lines uh, at here, and here there are four such bifundamental lines. Uh, so <coughs> so well, just this Liouville action is showing up uh, in a mysterious way, but I mean, for instance, it's, it's uh, exactly the same as uh, Sergei described this. Yeah, yeah. In fact, the, I think there is a very close connection. What, what but is yeah. The, what is the dimension of, uh, of this target space that this thing uh, resides? ADS three. It's just uh, an ADS three. This will be the radial direction of ADS three. This phi is the so radial direction. This gamma is just uh, like having a single uh, uh, xi with uh, only uh, one, one complex xi, which is the boundary. And then there's a radial direction. So this is the classical profile of the. Uh, uh, this this is the, cla the classically the uh, each of these will correspond to a classical string configuration, uh, and this classical string configuration has this uh, phi direction being given by this as a function of z, and then gamma, which is the other directions. So there'll be ADS three. <laughs> There'll be phi, and then there'll be gamma, gamma bar in the boundary. I'm sorry. Uh, you said before, but right now the whole discussion is about what we find this incorrectly correlate or twist fields. It's yeah. Some arbitrary symmetry. Yeah. Let's call the uh, central charge of the blow uh, C. The, the, 
the seed CFD. You're calling the child of the block in the, the blow up of the block uh, in the uh, so this one T4. Yeah, in yeah, this case, six, it would have been uh, six. Four, six, four, yeah. So six, in general, six, it would be C over 48 pi here. You know, it's an order one factor. Yeah, one? because that's the conformal anomaly. The, the Liouville anomaly. Yeah. How is the parameter capital N entering the, cor the value, the correlation function? It, it, this is in the large N limit. So they will enter only like N enters in the matrix model, just to weight the genus. Yeah, uh, uh, so, yeah, so in some sense, the weight associated with the Feynman graph is this. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, it, it's a little more, uh, it's not, um, uh, not quite as, uh, like, in terms of propagate weights associated with propagate, you associate this weight with this whole Feynman diagram, which is this Liouville weight. Uh, so it's a, it's a, I think it's due to the fact that this uh, Feynman diagram picture has, uh, it's a picture which is, has a certain, um, I think, the, it gives a natural picture for the way the world sheet behaves, but it's maybe not to be taken literally as for a field theory as a way to uh, the way we would say. But if, if you wish, each diagram has this weight. There might be something like this. I think it has not been explored so much. OK, so, um, so this, uh, so, so what is the, this thing? So, uh, so when you pull back, what happens is that, uh, so out of any vertex, which is, uh, um, so there'll be kind of, uh, so uh, the, the, again, you, it has a degree, it has uh, this branch cover, uh, and there'll be, the, it's the de there's a Riemann-Horwitz relation. And, and the Riemann-Hurwitz relation tells you that, uh, let me just, so now, unlike in the belly map case, where you had, uh, so the degree D, which is, uh, the degree which I guess I'll call K still, which is summation Ki, this is equal to the same Ki's, so I'm trying to use the same notation uh, between the matrix model and this so that it's sort of clear. But now there are n branch points, and each has branching number ki. So that's why this is the piece which we had earlier. This was the, B, uh, the br total branching number b. Uh, and then plus one minus the genus of this world sheet. So in fact, this, uh, I think uh, 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 I mentioned this uh, last time that uh, for a given correlator, there's a maximum genus that appears. Because for a given correlator, this is fixed. And uh, you can have a covering map only if this degree is greater than or equal to zero. So that tells you that the genus has to be less than in this. So there's a, that's very much like, again, in the matrix model, when you do the weak contraction, the genus is less than or equal to some, in a free theory, less than or equal to. And so that's a very similar thing. So typically, you'll have genus 0, genus 1, genus 2, all the way up to some maximum. Uh, OK, so, so I. So, uh, so uh, what I wanted to say here was that uh, there's a very similar picture, and there are discrete points again. And these discrete points are a little harder to characterize in general, and I think it's a very interesting question uh, to ca uh, characterize them um, in general. Uh, they, they, 
they are the ones which admit these covering maps. That's one way to characterize them, of course, but uh, something which is a little more uh, illuminating. But what I want to just show you in the rest of this uh, uh, lecture, maybe, yeah. is that we can take a certain limit uh, of these correlators with large K. So if you wish, it's some kind of a gross mende like limit or BMN-like limit where, so this, the, the twist translates into the dimension of the operators. So large K uh, twist, large twist operators are very high excited states. Uh, and I can consider their correlators. And it, this simplifies remarkably and shows yet, yet another, uh, shows many other things which I'll try to say, but one thing that the outcome will be, so let's now consider large twist. So all the ki go to infinity such that ki over k is fixed. And we'll call that equals to some alpha i. Uh, k, remember, is the sum over ki. Uh, so this is, so in this limit, we'll see that there's a, so in general, covering maps are not easy to, uh, again, find beyond four point functions. Uh, but what we'll see is in, and this somehow, I don't think even mathematicians have noticed, but in this large twist limit, you can actually solve for the covering maps. So it's a little unintuitive that you would think it becomes, but it, I think it's for physicists, it's no longer so intuitive that in, in, some, uh, uh, in some limit of when we can solve for the covering maps and the discrete points. So I said earlier that it's, we don't have a good way to characterize what are the discrete points uh, in general, but here we do. So the discrete points on modelized space are the same as in the Gaussian. So namely these arithmetic Riemann surfaces. So in that limit, you see that it's the same points, in the same set of discrete points that contribute. To mm. what G, the modular space of G and what sets N? N is the endpoint function. This N. Okay. So it's a very, I can't resist showing you uh, uh, how this happens, uh, in the calculation in a little detail, because it's very, uh, it was quite surprising uh, and remarkable how it works. And it shows another connection to matrix models, which, uh, which is uh, somewhat uh, was unexpected and in a way unexplained also. Uh, so we'll consider, well, so uh, technically speaking, actually we have shown this for genus zero. Uh, uh, so. I should say that, though I think some of the it should. Um, so we are looking for covering maps, genus zero. And so genus zero to genus zero covering maps. So as I said, gamma of z is a, it's a rational function. It's a polynomial of degree k, which is the degree ratio of two polynomials of degree k. Uh, of course, these are going to infinity. Um, so one way to impose what we, how do you solve for the covering map? You have to impose these conditions that there's certain branching at this point. So one way to say that is to look at the derivative of gamma, because here this implies that the derivative of gamma goes like z minus zi to the ki minus 1. So this constant term drops out, and that's very convenient. Uh, <laughs> so you can show that if I have a rational function, the derivative of gamma is also a rational function, and it is up to some overall constant. It has to be of this form. So 
I'm taking, uh, I'll parameterize this. So these are at the moment some uh, unknown polynomials. Uh, so I'll parameterize Q is a polynomial of degree K and its roots are lambda A. So that's how I'm parameterizing it. And I take the derivative, it has double poles. Uh, it, uh, so this, uh, this had poles at z equal to lambda a, so this will have double poles. And you can show that del gamma has to take this form. The numerator has to be, because you know that near each of the zi, it has to vanish like this. Uh, and this is true for all i, so it has to, and the degree of the polynomial matches, so it has to be exactly this. So there's no sum over because you know that the, the degree of the polynomial matches with what you get from here. I can show it it's a little exercise, but uh, uh, it's a degree 2k minus 2 polynomial. Uh, and this already has degree 2k minus 2. Uh, I think two yeah, something like that. So it's. Um, so. Mm, okay, so this is true for any k. This is how you would. Uh, so your task. If you someone asked you to uh, uh, to uh, solve for a covering map uh, uh, to save your life, what you would have to do is you would have to now try to solve for the lambda a's, knowing uh, so you would have to s solve for these lambda a's. Then you can you would get del gamma, and then you can in principle get gamma uh, by an integration. Uh, but uh, how do you ca uh, what is the conditions on the lambda a's? So this is very nice uh, that uh, I, I wrote it in this form, but we know that in addition, there's a condition that, that there can't be any single poles, simple poles in at, at z equal to lambda a. Why? Because if this thing, if I, so this certainly has terms which have double poles. But in general, you would expect it will also have something, a single pole, right? Yeah. You can't have that because if you were to integrate this, you would get a log. And you know that the original thing doesn't have a log. It's a rational function. So this coefficients must be equal to 0 for each lambda a. So you impose that condition, the vanishing of the residue. And what you get are very nice equations. And you'll be, well, uh, let me write those equations in blue in honor of my advisor, uh, because these are the scattering equations like the Gross-Mende equations that you get. So you get. So these are n. Uh, there are k equations here. Uh, this because you you have a condition for each simple pole, so you get k equations. So this is a sum over all the zi's. Zi's are given to you. Uh, k's are also part of the data specified. You are solving for lambda. So these are some complicated equations for lambda. So that's why it's not easy in general to solve for them. And, but if you did solve for them, I mean, this is true for, by the way, for any finite k or anything. And there's uh, exactly those sort of uh, sol uh, that many solutions because it's the same kind of equations. So there's, but there are discreetly many solutions. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so you have this now. So this is difficult to solve, but if you have been uh, uh, um, a high energy theorist, you, you recognize that in the large k limit, 
And that's why I use this uh, uh, kind of suggestive notation. You can think of these as eigenvalues of a k by k matrix. And this is the term that you get when you, the logarithmic, the, from the repulsion of the eigenvalues. So this is like the saddle point of a large n equa I mean a large n matrix model. So I'll write it as W prime uh, of lambda A is where W of Z is is something which is um, well, actually, I want to do it slightly differently. I want to put a 1 over k here. Uh, uh, so, yeah. So I want to write this like this because this, you might, those of you who have studied matrix models will recognize that this is the sort of large end saddle point that you have in a one matrix model with a potential W of x. This is the from the logarithmic repulsion term. When you take a derivative, you get this. Uh, uh, and that the other one is the potential term. So the logarithmic, this from the van der Mond term. So. Um, there are no symmetries you can use in this uh, manifold of Z. You cannot uh, use the the uh, I wonder whether there are some symmetries that can, can be used. Which symmetries? Uh, well, in, in this. Uh, in the space of Z, right, there, there are some... Uh, I mean, there's SL2C, which, of course, you trivially use, uh, but uh, if it's on the sphere, so you 0, 1, infinity, you can do that. But, yeah, I, I think that's as far as I... Uh, this thing. So, um, so now let's take... So till now, everything I said is true for uh, finite, uh, any finite K, but let me... So the potential in this particular case, which would generate something like this, is a logarithmic potential. So it's in fact something, again, it's a called a generalized Penner model. Uh, remember I had this Penner model that uh, arose in a very different context, which had a single log in its potential in the exponent. This is one which has sort of sum of logs. And this has also come up in some other contexts, Cyberwitten theory and so on. But, uh, so, but this is the matrix model. So once you recognize this, you're in business. You can apply all the matrix model technology. Uh, and uh, so let me, I won't belabor uh, all that. Uh, uh, I'll just tell you the central points. So, so what you do in such cases is you define the resolvent, uh, which is in terms of some density of eigenvalues, which has some support on some cut. Uh, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, in terms of an auxiliary quantity y of z, which is basically very essentially it's the same as uh, this resolvent. Uh, the way you often solve this is uh, you you have a what is called a loop equation, and in this case you can write that loop equation. Exactly. Minus some polynom uh, minus some another piece. So you can, those of you who have not seen the matrix model technology, maybe this might uh, be a little unfamiliar, but um, uh, you basically define this and uh, 
so you, you solve for the, you, your goal is to solve for the eigenvalue density, which you can do by solving for this resolvent or equivalently writing this spectral curve. This y of z is sometimes called the spectral curve. Because this gives uh, like the equation of some Riemann surface uh, associated to that matrix model. But the nice thing for us is that this y of z, if you go back and see what is this, this is basically 1 over z minus lambda a, a equals to 1 to k. That's basically what, uh, this is the continuum version of this object. And if you, if you actually, um, uh, if you actually uh, see what that is, um, uh, using uh, uh, the equations, you see that this y of z is actually just nothing but del of log del gamma. So if you want to solve the covering map, you just have to solve for y of z. Uh, so the spectral curve of the matrix model solves for you the, uh, the covering map. Uh, and which in turn is actually the Liouville field, if you wish, that same phi. So this, uh, that, 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 I wanted to say, this is the Liouville field. So, uh, so you can take the large K limit, the, uh, which is uh, the, uh, the leading order large K limit, you, I'll call that Y naught of Z is the, y of z as uh, so limit as k goes to infinity, the leading piece, uh, uh, this y naught of z, you can show is, takes the following form uh, from here, because you have w prime square, this so one, it, it takes this form, uh, so why not square, actually, is of this form. Uh, uh, but this is some polynomial which you can, uh, I mean, which, is, which has some unknowns which you are trying to solve for. Uh, this is, uh, so that's the problem in the end boils down, as I said, the problem of solving for the covering map is one of solving for this. And the, one, and the problem of solving for this is one of fixing some of the coefficients of this polynomial. Uh, and uh, this polynomial essentially comes from rationalizing this w. I can write out the explicit form of this, but uh, uh, at this stage, let me not get into that. But how do you fix this, uh, this things of this polynomial? You fix it by, so this is, uh, uh, so this has zeros, right? I mean, so uh, the polynomial has zeros uh, in the numerator, so that it has. So what is this object? This y not square of z is a very interesting, very uh, this thing object. Uh, it um, it has double poles at the at z i and zi are these insertions on the world sheet. So now we are in the z space. So this is the z space, this is the x space. Uh, uh, so it has double poles here. It, it, and then there, there's a numerator which has 2n minus 4 zeros. And it's a polynomial. Mm. In fact, the residue is. Uh, uh, the, uh, and with residue alpha i at the double poles, you can see that. Uh, alpha i is the same rescaled uh, ki over k, uh, this object here. <coughs> so, um, so how do you uh, fix this? And this is again from matrix models, you know what to do. Uh, this is fixed by the so-called filling fractions of the eigenvalues. So there will be many solutions. Mm -hmm. there, uh, so there will be many solutions to this uh, 
uh, uh, the so you have to specify additional data. So that's the statement as we've sa been saying all along. The gamma is not unique. There are many possible gammas. So how do you fix the gammas? You fix them by, uh, <laughs> so that in, in our uh, matrix model problem, it's about how do we fix some of the unknown coefficients in this polynomial. Um, the unknown coefficients are fixed by specifying specify the periods of y, y naught, of z. So y naught of z is some kind of a holomorphic form. y naught of z dz is a meromorphic one form on this Riemann surface. And it has cuts, as you see, because y naught squared is a polynomial. It has cuts. Uh, it's a, the numerator is it's like a hyperelliptic function. Uh, so it has um, 2n minus 6. Uh, um, uh, uh, cuts uh, square, root. square root cuts exactly uh, so uh, uh, so it has generically square root cuts and so there are so in the language of Riemann surfaces uh, so you think of this as that there are these a cycle periods and b cycle periods so this is like a genus 2n minus uh, so that genus n minus 3 kind of uh, 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 um, uh, uh, object here. Mm, uh, you can see if you put n equals to, say, uh, 3, you get, uh, so, uh, yeah, n equals to 4, you get, uh, you get a quartic polynomial. So that's y squared equal to, uh, so it has two cuts. So that's a genus 1, uh, and so, so on and so forth. Uh, you can see it's a genus n minus 3 kind of. Uh, uh, mm, so there are 2n minus 6 periods. So, so i 1 to n minus 3. And you have to specify this. So, so for any specified mu i and mu i, you get a solution. Once you know this, in principle, it's completely determined. But what? What is this new? So, so in some sense, uh, but uh, so these are, if you wish, the fraction of eigenvalues <coughs> along a given cut, because that's what this was a resolvent. So it's measuring how many. Uh, so the period is measuring actually the imaginary part of that resolvent, which is just the eigenvalue density. And this is computing how many eigenvalues are along a particular cut on that region. So this is the complex function resolvent. And it has cuts. And the cuts are where the discontinuities are. And the discontinuities are where there is eigenvalue support. And, uh, uh, and this measures those discontinuities and tells you the fraction of eigenvalues along those cuts. What so this. What are the A cycles? In sorry? What are the A cycles and B cycles? So you should think of this as a Riemann surface. Uh, so uh, uh, you don't even have to think of it as a Riemann surface. Uh, let me draw it actually. Now let me actually come back to this figure, because this is where the figure will be important. Um, so. Uh, as I said, there are poles here. And let's go back and understand, remember what I said, that lambda, lambdas are the zeros of Q, which are the <coughs> poles of gamma. And the poles of gamma are what I've marked here by these circles. That Remember, this was x equal to infinity. x is gamma of z. So this is the pole. So the three images of the poles are here. So these are the lambdas. Of course, here I've drawn a very simple Feynman diagram. Now, imagine when k is very large, there are many lines coming out. And these poles, which are these lambdas, are coalescing into a cut. Uh, so there will be many of these. And they will form a cut. And, uh, uh, and so you will have some cut structure which will, so then there'll be, 
So the cut structure will go something like this. <coughs> There'll be some cut structure. Uh, the, imagine that there are many, many uh, such lines coming over here, uh, and so all those lambdas are coalescing into these cuts because the lambdas are the poles, and th that's what is coalescing into these cuts. And so these periods are basically each of these. Uh, so along the so uh, along the Riemann surface, you have these A's. So there will be A cycle and B cycle will be along each of these cuts. There will be, if you think of it as a Riemann surface, there will be two complementary sets of uh, uh, non-trivial cycles. Like in a torus, you can have the, this cycle and that cycle. If you think of it as a two-cut Riemann surface, those are really the, there's one around one of the cuts and then there's one between the two cuts, right? I mean, if I have on a torus, with two cuts, there is an A cycle like this, and then there's a B cycle like this. So it's, that's the analog of what I'm drawing over here, the A cycle and the B cycle. So you can think of a li in line integral <coughs> along these cuts. So these are line integrals along the cuts of this, uh, uh, of this uh, object, because that's what you're doing here. This is why not? So you take the square root, so the, the square root branch cut. But now is the interesting point that this fraction of eigenvalues is nothing but the fraction of weak contractions of the original Feynman diagram. You see, because each of these these poles. Yeah, fraction, I mean the following. Take a given vertex. Now, uh, there's a cut like this, which is transverse to the original, uh, which is transverse to the original big contractions. And the zeros, I mean the poles, are basically to each, basically to each, between each two lines, you get a pole. So you get multiple poles. If I have multiple wick contractions, there are multiple poles. And, and that cut is measuring how many poles are there between <coughs> in the line between this and this. And yeah, then this how many poles are there. Yeah, and this limit, yeah, the number. It's a fraction of the well, total number of poles, yeah. Yeah, because the number of lines. Is going to, so you're taking ki to be very large and this so the total number ki and k so each of these there are ki lines coming out of this k1 k2 k3 k4 but some fraction of them are contracted here some fraction contracted here some fraction contracted there and this measures precisely that fraction so uh, it's just exactly from the definition of the whole thing it follows that you get so, so in other words, I said that these specify the point on the modelized map. These specify the covering map. And the covering map is now <coughs> specified by the Feynman diagram. So for each Feynman diagram, you get a covering map. And the covering map is specified by the fraction of big contractions that are there between these different vertices. So as you vary this fraction, uh, so this ki, uh, will there'll be some sum over some uh, beta ij, where j, uh, j is not equal to i. Okay, so this beta ij is really proportional. I shouldn't, I should have used a different letter. Uh, these go over a different index, but uh, yeah. Anyway, a alpha, nu alpha. So these are like the new alphas and um, new alphas. So 
you get these the different sets of fractions. And, uh, and this, uh, so it tells you basically that, so what it's telling you is that there are, so you can, uh, so in other words, the way to solve for the covering map is, I specify a Feynman diagram associated with a covering map in which I specify these fractions of Wick contractions, and I solve this mathematical problem, namely of that I'm, I'm, uh, that the integrals are given by this that completely specifies why not, which completely then determines gamma. So that's how you mathematically would solve for the covering map in principle. It's a fairly explicit solution. But what is its interpretation? And that's the last thing I just want to say. And stop, but, I mean, stop the technical part of it at least. Um, the last thing I want to say is that now, this so wine on. For general n. For small n, it can be considered explicitly. For small k? n. n is uh, the, this n. Yeah, little n. Again, for four point function, non it gets tough. It's a elliptic integrals. So yeah. you can write it in terms of some elliptic. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's not. Uh, it's, uh, OK, you can r do some things with it. Uh, so, in any case, uh, what I wanted, so this is the fraction of big contractions. Now I claim that these points on the modelized space, and that was the claim I made at the beginning, that these points, so there are many, there are, it's a dense, discreetly, there are large number of covering maps, and they kind of, in some sense, will densely cover the modelized space. And the way you see that is that this uh, these relations, this y naught of z, turns out to be what is called a Strebel differential of the Riemann surface. Uh, and I didn't have time in these lectures to expose you to the wonderful uh, features of Strebel differentials, but uh, the Strebel differential is basically a way, uh, a unique quadratic differential that exists on a Riemann surface, which allows you to characterize which point on the modelized space it is on. And, and it is characterized by its periods. So the periods, uh, and when these periods, in general, for a Strebel differential, there'll be some uh, numbers. Uh, real. So the, a Strebel differential is characterized by the fact that these periods are real. Because in general, the periods could be complex. It's a, complex meromorphic function. But when they are real, that's when it's a Strebel differential. And moreover, when they are rational, as in this case, because it's a fraction of the weak contractions or the fraction of the eigenvalues, when it's rational, those points are these arithmetic Riemann surfaces. So this, uh, so these points correspond to points on the moduli space, which admit these coverings map. are these arithmetic surfaces. <coughs> the arithmetic surfaces which arose in the Gaussian model. So, so one of the lessons I take away from this is that, in general, you get discrete points on the modelized space, and it's determined by the covering map. It is very, it depends sensitively on the xi's, these xi's. <laughs> But in this large twist limit, somehow the x dependence gets washed out, and all that comes out as some trivial prefactors. And what you're left with is the same set of points as the Gaussian matrix model explores. So that's the sense in which the Gaussian model is sort of the mother of all these uh, dualities, that it has the basic structure which you can uncover in which all these dualities, I believe, uh, in inappropriate limits, you probe that those points on this modelized space, which are these very special arithmetic points. So, okay, that's the technical part I wanted to say, and uh, I'll just take one minute.
uh, to just uh, make some, I don't want to end on a technical note, um, um, but uh, so yeah, I, I, I mean, there were many things I wanted to do which I didn't end up doing, but um, uh, for instance, I didn't talk about the ADS-5 turns S5 case at all. Um, but uh, I mentioned right at the beginning that there is sort of this chain. I started with matrix models, then this next complexity of symmetric orbifolds, then there's free angles. And there is, I think, an embedding. I, I, I've tried to show you at least some some aspects of at least an embedding from the field theory point of view between the Gaussian model and the um, symmetric orbifold that you can sort of see that firstly the same kind of structure, the same uh, way in which Feynman diagrams are associated with world sheets, but more precisely in a limit like this, you get exactly the same points and so on. And that is really reflected, I think, in the bulk as well. And it is related to these ideas of twisted holography of uh, Costello and Gaiotto, I, I think, in, and in some ways, it's the statement that even in n equals to 4 angles, there are certain special correlators, and Nadav and others have uh, worked on this, uh, uh, are given by just matrix models, matrix integrals. Uh, Nadav and David worked on the Wilson loop, which had a different kind of trace e to the m operator, but there are trace m to the k operators as well, which you can, which capture some information about the BPS correlators in n equal to four young mills. So the matrix models that I have been, that I spent a lot of time on, do sit inside the n equals to four young mills as a protected subsector. In fact, there is an intermediate subsector, which is the chiral algebra subsector, uh, of um, where uh, where the correlation functions are not uh, totally independent of the positions, but they depend holomorphically on the positions. So it's in between a matrix model and this, and it's that on the dual side is very much like a ADS three times S three as proposed by Costello and Gaiotto. So that's the sense in which I think there is an inclusion of this uh, matrix models. Um, uh, symmetric orbifolds and n equals to 4 and there's the dual versions of these which is I think this SL2R mod U1 in the world sheet dual to uh, here the ADS3 which is and here the ADS5 and they kind of sit inside the subsectors sitting inside embedded in the bulk as well uh, and learning therefore about reconstructing the world sheet for each of these will, I think, tell us more about the ADS-5 theory, uh, uh, finally, I think. Um, and what I didn't at all get to talk to was, I showed you a way to bridge between the field theories and the uh, world sheets in that I brought you up to these closed string world sheets, uh, which are built up from the um, uh, see, but we didn't talk so much about the theory itself that lives on that world sheet, which from the other side we have been doing for, and in the case of ADS-3 and in the case of the SL2R module 1, I think we can actually now connect the two sides. Uh, and ADS-3 we have, I think, already connected the two sides. Uh, I think we'll be able to do this in this, uh, uh, with the matrix model. and. Therefore, and we have a proposal for the ADS-5 world sheet theory, which, um, uh, which, uh, which I think will help us to uh, this thing that. And just one last comment, and I'm done. Um, so, I, so this discreteness of the world sheet, uh, which is ultimately coming from these weak contractions of perturbative gauge theories. I think it's a universal fact. And uh, and I think, so you're building up the closed string from these uh, discrete string bits, the, the large N gauge theory diagrams uh, 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 build up for you. So even if your interest is not in, uh, in holography or uh, well, in not in terms of how the string stringy behavior or the tensionless limit 
uh, occurs. I think this tells you uh, potentially a concrete way to build up the bulk from the from these uh, bits of Yang Mills or whatever large end fields. So I like to say that the qubits of the uh, the qubits of the uh, 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 the Yang Mills theory uh, are really like the string bits. So I instead of it from qubit, I would like to say it's qubit from bit. So uh, so in some sense, from the string bits, you build up the qubits and therefore the whole bulk. So the really, I think the string bits are the microscopic degrees of freedom that then uh, build up the string theory. But that's just speculation. And um, thank you very much. So uh, I think perturbatively it should hold, though it has to be fleshed out some more. Because once you know all correlators around the free theory, that's like knowing infinitesimally you're in a neighborhood of the, uh, this thing you are expanding, pulling down from the exponent. And in a sense, in the Gauss, in the one matrix model, that's what we had. Because we, were, we had the whole generating function of uh, correlators. So, in a way, you can think of it as a deformation from the Gaussian uh, point. For the ADS3 case also, since we now have reasonably explicit forms for the correlators, uh, 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 I, I think um, one should be able to see this. Uh, what, is a, uh, what would be of interest to me, and this is something, again, I could touch on, is from the world sheet point of view, also, from so in ADS3 we have a dual world sheet picture in terms of this uh, BSU one comma one slash two Wesemino Witten model, which becomes sort of free bits in the tensionless limit. But I think these will become nearest neighbor interacting bits when you when you turn on the coupling, very much like what the people in integrability have, uh, because what you have there are these spin <coughs> chains. And these spin chains are basically these little bits of the Yang Mills fields or the symmetric orbifold fields. Uh, and in the in the free limit, they are like free bits. They are only glued by the large M Gauss law constraint, which is a sort of a cyclic symmetry of all these uh, UN. Uh, so they are non-interacting in some sense. Uh, they they just have a global <coughs> constraint. But once you turn on the coupling, I think you'll have nearest neighbor coupling, next to nearest neighbor coupling, and so on between these bits. And that's, I think, how one would connect to the integrability picture. Uh, but it, that's what I would like to see fleshed out. Uh, uh, and uh, that, that would, I think, uh, show you that. Okay, let's thank you.